Tony doesn't typically vote. Uh, if we're short a member, he could vote on a uh, proposal. So that's how that's going to work. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first... Um, Mr. Richard, you want to tell us a little bit about your background? Uh, sure. I, um, I come from a, a varied background in a, probably both a 10-year period of economic development um, experience over a slightly longer period than that. Um, and that was primarily um, in New York City, where uh, I was working on a number of projects um, for uh, Mayor Giuliani and Mayor Bloomberg. Um, lots of different, <coughs> both large-scale developments um, and uh, mixed-use developments, neighborhood um, rezoning and revitalization, um, and some interesting projects like the Yankee Stadium change and the, the Nets moving to Brooklyn. Um, so I, I worked with the the developers, um, with the community, with the neighborhood um, uh, organizations, and there's a lot of those in New York, um, as well as the business community, folks that would be inhabiting uh, the developments that would um, that were being built. I also spent about five years at a nonprofit that did um, thinking about urban economic development and, um, in particular, kind of retail development in downtown areas. Okay, Tony, you're a townie. Yeah, you're going to make me follow that. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I've been a townie for about 20 years, and I've been sitting in the audience for 20 years. Uh, I live down by Walker's Brook, so I went through the entire Walker's Brook Stage 1, Phase 2, uh, Stop and Shop, Market Basket, uh, Hallmark Health, all those developments around me, so I know where the audience and, and citizens are coming from. Thanks. Okay. So, you have the Meadowbrook um, winter all. Does that have to be read? Yeah, I would read it and then just vote on it and make it official. Okay. So, the applicant for the Meadowbrook golf course has uh, requested to withdraw without prejudice. Uh, it says, Dear Mr. Chairman, this office has retained its legal counsel by Meadowbrook Golf Club regarding applications for site plan review and a special permit currently pending before your commission related to my client's property located at 292, aka 288, Grove Street in Reading. On behalf of my client, Meadowbrook Golf Club, I respectfully request with, to withdraw the application for site plan review and special permit without prejudice. So that's what they have requested on the motion. Um, move that the CPDC accept the uh, withdrawal of the Meadowbrook Golf Club proposal uh, without prejudice. Does that have any discussion? Do you have a question? No? Okay. All in favor? Yeah. All right. So that opened up an hour here. <laughs> About an hour. And we have a couple of things to discuss. Um, so potential zoning bylaws amendments. Remember to speak up. Sir? Remember to speak up. I will. Okay. I think the first thing you want to take up here rather quickly is the accessory accessory buildings or structures. And Julie, do you want to summarize what we're doing here? Or what we were sure. supposed to do? So section 5.5 .5, accessory buildings or structures really mostly pertains to residential structures. Um, but there's a section of it that mentions like any accessory structure that's within a side or rear yard setback needs to be no more than 12 feet in height. Um, and the way that like now when um, applicants come in and they want to put an accessory structure in an industrial or business area, we apply that 12 foot height to that structure and it doesn't always necessarily make sense. Um, so I think it was kind of an oversight that we didn't really address what happens with accessory structures in districts that are non-residential. So I propose some language, but in looking to write this language, I noticed that most towns that I looked at 
regulate accessory uses, but not structures, non-residential accessory structures, kind of like what we had. Like, so it was hard for me to know like exactly how to write it, like what, what makes the most sense. So I kind of just threw some ideas together. Um. And that's because 5514 says other accessory buildings or structures and doesn't say anything about just residential. And so the building inspector is applying that to industrial. Yeah, and that first part, um, like part A says, ex just says accessory buildings or structures within required side yards or required rear yards shall be limited to one story or less than 12 feet in height. So it doesn't say it explicitly applies to just residential, which would then actually just leave a complete gaping hole for what to do with accessory structures in other districts. But then it, it maybe is like too restrictive. But it's only within that required Yes, right, so. right. So we don't, I mean, my initial fix here is like just for accessory structures that are within the side and rear yard setback, but which begs the question of whether we should talk about non-residential accessory structures that actually do meet setbacks, like if we need to have more full regulations about them. Um, but I wanted to at least start the conversation and see where you guys stood on the issue before I like really delved into it. Well, I always like to start with the map. So what happens if there's a non con this is industrial districts, not industrial uses? Right. And we could add uses. And my concern would be like a non conforming industrial use in a, yeah. adjacent to a residential district. Right. Oh, I noticed the you're carefully saying residence district rather than residential. Only and because I noticed that that was the way it was worded throughout the section, and there was like some areas where it said residential, and so I just changed it to make it consistent. Okay. Um, I don't really care if you choose residence or residential. I think the word residence actually came from town council, so just went with that. I don't think I've ever heard it referred to like that. Yeah, I hadn't either until I read this more closely. Well, I, I noticed it because the the rest of the zoning bylaw uh, uniformly says residential. Yes. And that's how one, one says residential. Yeah. You can change it back. I just, I'm, I think that that was a change that town council made when you guys updated this last time. So, because I never would have written it that way. So how does this impact non-conforming residential law? How do they get accessory structures? Non-conforming residential lot? Well, <coughs> all of the Green Street lots are non-conforming, right? Uses. Non-conforming uses? Oh, non-conforming yeah. uses. Yeah. yeah. Well, so this talks about residence districts and and then um, single or two family dwellings and non-residence districts. That's why I'm wondering if town council is trying to distinguish between a residential district or a district that has residences in it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that means a nuance <laughs> that isn't defined anywhere. I'm well, not saying he wasn't, but inter yeah. interestingly, the um, I should have looked before I, I opened my mouth. The existing bylaw, which is in effect, the table of uses has residential use, but it also uh, says table of uses for residence Resident districts. districts. Yeah, it kind of, it's all over the place in the bylaw. Yeah. So I just like this paragraph called it out as residence. So I just changed everything in this paragraph to make it consistent. I don't know if that. It's, it's really I mean, the town, not, town council probably has the right idea in this case. Because <laughs> it, it's a, you know, residential use 
in a residence district. Yeah. So the use of the language is consistent. The uh, but I'm not sure that we have explicitly regulated the accessory within non-residence districts. I mean, other than uh, numbers and so forth. We've regulated the uses, but we haven't really regulated the structures. Right. Okay. And right. like I mentioned, when I was trying to find guidance from other towns, I had a really hard time finding any town that regulates non-residential accessory structures. So. Well, we, we regulate them. We regulate them that they have to be within the standards of the principal um, structure. Well, so do we what, clearly say that anywhere, though? Well, uh, letter E does. And I think that I don't have the whole thing either, but I thought that we had identified that elsewhere. So I guess what I know what we were trying to do with 55514 was to provide more flexibility to residential uses um, in the case where, right, it all came up about sheds and garages that, you know, that it, it that there are plenty of cases where it's not infringing on the neighborhood neighbor to, to put a, a shed in that required side yard or, or rear setback. So I guess my question is, um, do we, um, do we, is there a reason to provide industrial uses that same like the flexibility. The flexibility yeah in those um, those setbacks well what I thought was odd about that first um, the 5511e was that it sort of called out like a certain type of structure it says non-residential accessory structures and then including vending machines, ATMs, electronic game kiosks. So I just, I wasn't sure if it was meant to be more specific to those things. I think the way that you rewrote it, it is. I think that originally it was, and because I think we did this, or not we, but this was done uh, throughout the zoning code where we, where examples were provided to make sure that those were covered, um, but not necessarily to, to point to say those were the specific instance, and then at some point those get interpreted as it's actually pointing to those, you know, to, a, to a, like an ATM. But okay. oftentimes it was just to, to emphasize, yes, ATMs fall under an, uh, uh, accessory structure. I mean, so I rewrote it that way so there wouldn't be a conflict with what I wrote below. But, like, no, uh, you yeah, know, I'm yeah, happy yeah, to yeah, take yeah, it away. Like, yeah. If yeah. that was the intent, I just yes. was, I thought it was a little odd that certain things were called out. Um, but I get it. Are we thinking that you're going to try and get this into the November town meeting? No. Okay. No, it's already closed. Mm -hmm. All right. okay. Are there specific discussions, I, I, I don't want to get into a specific case, but are there discussions that you have had with folks that they aren't able to do something because yes. of they want to do something in the side, the side of the Right, side. so there's one specific um, instance um, which kind of brought this to light. Mm -hmm. And then I thought like if we're talking about potentially like redeveloping down in the industrial area, it might be something that comes up mm -hmm. more. Um, yeah. But I don't know if, like, Ed, if you want to say something, but it relates to Ed's property down on Ash Street. Um, that was the sort of impetus for this. Sure, do you want me to comment on it? I'm wondering, I'm wondering if the impact to you was more of the height or the <coughs> setback? The height. The height was restricting you. But it's because he's within, he doesn't meet the setback. 
Right. Okay. So they're both, both yeah. integrally related. It's something that should be addressed. We could figure out how to craft all this word to make sure we're not. Um, Can I cover it? So it's industrial district fully or industrial district um, abutting residential district. So that's a conversation that you guys can have. But this was initially conceived as being just for the industrial district. Okay. Well, specifically the non residents. More than just industrial. Well, so I just actually talked about industrial district, and then I put a note with whether we would want to include business districts and try to craft some language for that as well. Um, I didn't know if that was opening up like a bigger can of worms because we have various business districts, and a lot of those actually have a lot of residential abutters. Um, so I didn't know if we want to do it all at once or just take a piece now and give the other give the business districts more consideration. Mm -hmm. um, so. The setbacks you're looking at currently for business A are 15 feet from front, 10 for the side, the side and 20 for the rear, correct? And then business B is just 20 in the rear? What is it in, in industrial since you have it up there? Uh, in industrial, it's 50 in the front, 20 on the side, and 20 in the back. <clears throat> Say 50, 5, zero? Five zero. Yes. That's the required front of yours. Okay. So that was left over from, from before we changed that elsewhere. Because it used to be 50 for business. Mm -hmm. as well. It still is actually. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Uh, no, um, no. No, 20. Oh, I'm 15. looking at it. Does it say 15, 1, 5? It depends on what you want to build. If you look yes. at the table. So for hotels and motels, it's 15, does it say? Um, it looks like for industrial, it's consistently 50. Well, I mean, I think we should address it and just figure out <coughs> what these words mean, residents versus residential, if there is any impact to that. Well, on the second look, I don't think there is an impact. I think it's the, as written, it's correct. So you think they're just interchangeable? Um, no. I think the bylaw is written to use residence district residential use yes okay i guess um there's a reason why we have setbacks um and whether it's whether it's a um principal structure or an accessory structure it's the same impact to the, the butter. So I, I, I guess my my take on this is is are the setbacks the right thing? Um, when those industrial districts aren't abutting but another district, residential or commercial. Um, I'm not sure. You know, we have those. We have those different setbacks and requirements for commercial districts that abut residential districts right. because of that interplay between the two. Um, uh, I guess if it's if you're talking about an, an abutter to another industrial parcel, I think that's a different consideration than if it's if you're abutting a, you know some other type of use. Okay. I, I don't know why we would consider 
different heights within the residential district. I mean, within the industrial district. I mean, it's sort of, um, there's specific cases where we're doing that in the residential district. I'm not, I don't even understand. I don't, I don't, can't imagine what that is that wouldn't have that a, a big effect. Um, what is it you're saying, John? Why are we, why, if it's a, if it's a, if we want to allow an uh, accessory building 30 feet in height, well, why wouldn't we just change the setback if that's really what we want to allow? Because I don't, if I'm in a butter, I don't care whether it's a principal, bu principal building or a, a, an accessory building. That's still a big, big building staring at me in the face. The, the whole the whole reason why we looked at allowing accessory structures in in setbacks was because I think that it's generally sort of understood and agreed in the residential <coughs> districts that you can put garages and sheds in that in that and it's really not going to change the character and really like, people do it anyways um, it's not changing that character but um, but if there's something more substantial then we should be looking at it more holistically not just how do we how do we look at those accessory structures in that area. So you're saying change the setbacks for principal structures as well? I'm saying we, we ought to be thinking about that. I'm not sure if, if it's not right, it's not right. Okay. You know, if it's right, it's right. Um, that's my take. I think if it's a budding or residence district, then you either get the setback or you get the height. Right, so if the accessory structure is allowed to be within the setback, then there should be the height limit. That's the impact. Because we, we allow principal structures in industrial districts to be like 60 feet tall. So I feel like there is a difference. Whether you have a 60 foot building like five feet from the property line or a 30 foot building five feet from, I mean, maybe that's not a good example because right. the, the person experiences the 30 right. feet. Right. But like, you know, like a smaller, on a smaller scale, I feel like there would be a difference. Uh, I think industrial to industrial is one thing. Industrial abiding the others mm -hmm. is different concern. Yeah, um, but I'm, I'm thinking about it. I think that the regulating uh, or varying the height um, based on the abutting district is reasonable. So we were, we are restricting it to the side and the rear yards only, and so the, the, they can't. Uh, encroach on the front setback uh, according to the current law. You can't have the accessory structure in the front. Yeah, setback. we don't allow it. Right. Right, because we want the principal structure to be the dominant structure. Right. Does 50 feet make sense in the industrial district? Well, the building, the building height is, or when the, the front yard is 50 feet, the building height is 60 feet. Yeah, I mean, 50 is a lot. It just constrains these lots even more. Right. And they're not necessarily abutting anything that Well, that's why right. I think we need to makes use it matter. We need to do yeah. the math and see where these things are. Okay. And can you do, can you allow different setbacks at different heights? Yeah, you guys could do anything. <laughs> what? You could have it step back if you have to step back. And the whole reason why, right, we, we, it, it was done incrementally back in the 80s in when things were still car focused, right, we had 50 foot setbacks on every, pretty much any, everything in town. Um, that got changed just for the thing that was the most obvious which was, you know, South Main Street, and I, and I guess at the time we didn't bother with the industrial district. Um, but on the same, I mean, because we never had that conversation. Um, and um, it was also a non-issue. I mean, we, right, right, right. Because our only industrial district is Walker's Brook, if yes, you will, yeah. which enforces the 
the setback. Substantial yeah. setback and um, and so forth. So it's, uh, geographically, it didn't make it. It was yeah. unnecessary. Yeah. yeah. But if we're looking at all these, we um, yeah. reconsider that. So do a more holistic yeah. approach to this rather than like a piecemeal quick fix kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Okay. Do you guys want to look at other priorities for today? Yeah, let's look at the priority, zoning priority list. This last enough? presented. Um, it's been a while. I think it was before. Um, November 2016 town meeting, like sometime that summer. Before we had all of those zoning changes in that couple yeah. Of meetings, we had yeah, because I added. Um, I added the column for November 2016 and April 2017, and then the future priorities I updated. Okay. Um, and I took away a 2013 column because there just wasn't room. Sure. Um, well, as you can see, what we have at the top here is this sub-district guidelines, which have been brought to light with the recent projects, and probably should be addressed first anyways. We're going to do, put an effort into some zoning that might be what we want to do. I guess that's what I think. Mm -hmm. What I think we would do is just get schedule a couple of planning sessions where we solicit all the concerns and ideas and then take all of that and bring those to a workshop where they can be um, worked on in detail. We would do some pre work on whatever the ideas are, find other examples. Uh, other information we want to put into that, and then we have that to discuss and work out. That's what I was thinking, but I don't know what you guys are thinking about that. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds good. Um, so, when would you be targeting town meeting on that one? Okay, well, I thought that the, I guess the only thing that has to go to town meeting would be the sub district. But the standards do not. Yeah. We can implement those any time. So do we actually have to have a sub-district? Is that part of the zoning map? Or is that part of the zoning? Is that part of the guideline? It probably would need to be on the zoning map, I would think. Um, but I can look into 4ER and mm -hmm. see what the specifics are. So what happens is zoning has to go through, has to be written up and then get approved through a public process and then it goes to town meeting to get voted on. The standards are separate from the zoning so that we can update them without having to go through the town meeting process. It's a little less tedious. You know, if something comes up, it's like, oh, this should be like this and we can correct it. It's still a public process. It's just that it doesn't have to go to town meeting. But I still think Right, so let's check and see what the process is, whether it has to go to town meeting. We could still write them or get them going, or potentially <coughs> list out where these guidelines apply, and then we could apply them, right? Well, if we don't call it a sub-district, you know, we could say, Wolf well, Street is this, and Green Street is that, and Hash Street is this. Well, could you, could you put, instead of developing specific um, sub districts on a map with borders. Um, could you put more like, I'm going to say more of like a performance um, uh, standard in um, where if, if these certain conditions exist, then this guideline applies? Yeah, I'm willing to look at that. As long as there isn't yeah. something specifically yeah. in 40 yard that says we can't do something. That's a good yeah. idea. Yeah. Uh, like an if then. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember. Especially if the downtown is going to would be like consistently changing, you know, like, <coughs> or continuously changing. Like, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I don't remember. We had to go through the DHCD for the design guidelines. I thought, yeah. So we do have to get the state approval. Right. Um, and I, that probably applies to changes as well as. The uh, parameter, parameter 
districts. If you will. Was there a limit on sub districts? I thought there was. I don't know. I'll have to look. I thought there was a limit of two sub districts. You should check on that too. Mm -hmm. Take any public comments on that particular process? Um, Do you have any questions on that process? What is the sub district? So right now, there is an uh, overlay district in the downtown that has the 40 that allows 40R. This this um, zoning option that somebody could take and do a mixed use development. Right now, the downtown is zoned for business, and there is an overlay district for. Is for you. Um, but it's just one district without without separating out what might be happening in any particular location. It's all the same rules. And our ability to, to approve variances, if you will, or to ask for more or less of something lets us craft the project as it gets to some specific neighborhood. Not variances. Not waivers. waivers. Sorry, yes, waivers, sorry. Granting waivers. Having a sub district would say this area has these guidelines and the regular 40 r has these guidelines. And so you can get really specific as to what's happening in that particular neighborhood. You know, and write something that brings the scale down or has a different architecture to it or a different mix. Well, let me just follow up on that. But this is going to happen in every neighborhood that this touches in the future. 40R? Yeah. In the yeah, we're district. in all of us residential neighborhoods. Um, we're going to have the same problem. Well, it's over the entire neighborhood. So it's not, I'm trying to think of which residential district it's abutting. I guess it will be on the Lincoln Street side. And there are rules for that already. Right. So where this district abuts a residential district, and I remember this is a confusion that we had a little bit earlier. You're not in a residential district, you are a business residential fee. Business fee. Business fee. Business fee. Yeah, but it's residential uses. And, and so there, you're within the whole district, we would write rules for within that district. When you start touching other districts, then you have consideration for what does that neighborhood look like and what should you be doing there? And we address some of that in our guidelines. I don't know if you've looked at them actually, but we talk about how, you know, specifically what the setbacks are and what the um, angle of, of um, viewing. the viewing angle is from the building face, so the building has to continue to step back so that you, you know. So we, we did address some of those things as we abut residents' districts. Distance, distance. No, I, I get that, but, um, and I don't agree with that angle personally, but, um, on Main Street, where Sunoco gas station is, that's in the 40-hour, correct? Yes. Yes. So, there's a residential, you have the Sunoco gas station, then you have residential. Yes. So, you, we're going to have the same problem as we're having with Green, Gould, and Ash when something happens down there. That's... Uh, and it's just, it's just, as part of this whole process, you know, um, my main emphasis is, is where I'm at, but to try to eliminate this, you know, going down the road for everyone else. There's probably, I'm going to say, 12 properties, 12 commercial properties in town that do not abut a residential district. Our entire commercial di commercial zoning district of butts residential and that's so every for the past 12 I, I don't even know how long I've been on this board uh, 10 12 years every just about every um, um, uh, development that comes in that's 90% of what we we try to address is how that 
impacts the abutting residential district because that's what we have here in Reading is commercial district and the next property owner property over is residential. So all the you know everything that we would do, whether it's whether it's you know these design guidelines or whatever kind of sub district guidelines, it 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 has to address that that interface because we have it. It's so pervasive in in our. It's not uh, just forty yards. Just not forty yards. Restaurants yeah. on South Main Street. Behind them are residential properties, and right. we've addressed their concerns specifically. Okay. So, would you agree that our neighborhood is a very specific and special case in this scenario, since most of your commercial stuff doesn't apply? Like you said, residential. I mean, you know, and if we do become a sub district. Is this something you're actually considering? And you know, could you give the neighbors a, a waiver or variance from that, and you know, give us those setbacks um, in our just our little sub district since we weren't supposed to be part of 40 yards to begin with? To begin with, with what? Well, a year, you know, you said that people asked me that a year ago we were assured we weren't part of 40 yard during those meetings, those abutters meetings, and then. In January, you had your meeting with the selectmen's office, and um, I've you know, watched it now a bunch of times. And you guys had a similar conversation about including the 40R, and it was a really positive conversation where it was like, you know, this is a great thing, maybe we should add them in. And um, to the, it was so a positive and like effective that nobody was really thinking about what it would do if something like this into the middle of our neighborhood. Um, John Halsey said, this is going to be a win-win for everybody. Maybe seven or eight of them could sell their homes as a bundle to a developer, and he could rip them down and build a 40-something. And there were, a lot of, there were a lot of references to uh, a New York neighborhood, brownstones, um, just, and someone else said, like, put your bulldozers away, you can't bulldoze the whole town. Just there was a lot of conversation. It was all positive. There was no negative. But there were no abutters at the meeting because we weren't notified that you guys, like, it was an abutters thing. It was, we were already kind of aware of the fact that 40R was going to be in that triangle, and then we were out again. And then you guys said, okay, let's, time is of the essence, I think it was. I have all these, I've become an avid binge watcher of <laughs> town meetings. <laughs> And I draw all the characters, and I can't. Yeah, it's a lot. I don't know how you do what you do. Um, I, you know, I, I couldn't do it um, all the time. But either way, um, you know, were you talking about these things to change the zoning in for us in this particular case, or going forward for others? Well, I think I don't think they'd be in place okay. for this one. Um, but we're still addressing a lot of those concerns with. That this particular project okay. um, and a lot of the things that come out of this one might be in design guidelines right. design standards but um, you like no one's going to rip down their houses and these are all historic houses that were built in if you've watched time. every meeting I, I've always said there's no way that all of these properties would fall at once it just won't happen because someone doesn't want to sell their house they want to live there right no, so it's, it's not going to be you know clear out the whole downtown and just build something completely different Right, but you know, if you have that and you have that momentum, you have a group of people who are all thinking the good of it all. I mean, that was a comment, you know, you know that was a crazy comment, I thought. You know, she ripped down six or seven houses in a row, and then hey, whose house there, like the little guy in the movie up. You know, I, you know, we can't rip down, we have to refurbish and restore instead of ripping down and rebuilding. Yeah, I, I, so I mean, our guidelines, our bylaws have to reflect that. Was anything even like that done in, in New York, where you're taking down entire no way. neighborhoods? <laughs> no. You know, there's there's value in there, and there's people who are committed to, to living in there. So that that's a very unique neighborhood. It's got, you know, a different scale. It's got some historic buildings to it, um, and it's in a downtown district, which is susceptible to you know more. Traffic, and I don't mean traffic by car traffic, I just mean like people. It's, it's, mm -hmm. There's activity down there, there should be. It's the appropriate place for that use. So there's a lot of different things happening along those edges, and I think we just have to address them. Mm -hmm. 
I think as a whole, um, I'm not in a butter. I, I live elsewhere in town. I've been in the town for almost 24 years. And um, I'm very concerned. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Could you could have your name? Lucia Corbett. Thank you. Um, and I'm very concerned about the changing landscape of our town. Um, it used to be, a, I mean, it, it should be a charming little town. And that particular area is looks like it's being overrun by enormous developments. And I don't think it's appropriate. I think we should be limiting um, height on these buildings and um, how much of a footprint they're taking over. Um, it's just, it's going to look like a hodgepodge. Okay. And it really should. Now, I'm, I'm going <clears> to <throat> express the, the unpopular but reality situation is that it is zoned business. Now, we didn't do that. That's town meeting. Um, because it is zoned business, if you own a house of property in that area, you can't sell it to somebody and have them tear down the house and make a, be a better house. It's not allowed. You can't, re you can't rebuild or, or improve except within the, the scope of a non-conforming use, pre-existing non-conforming use. The same thing is true all the way down South Main Street with business A on the, on the curb, if you will, 50 feet back, it's, there's a transition from the, the business A to the, the residence district. So the, the actual, the opportunity for somebody to come in and redevelop <coughs> the property they can't redevelop it as a house, as a residence, because it's that's not part of the zoning. And the 40, 40R is a way to, in principle, enhance your property value, because it'd be more opportunity for somebody to purchase it from you and do something else with the property. And we, it, the state law gave us the opportunity <coughs> to put in design guidelines, more constraints, and to do what we could to control that. But the fact of the matter is, you can't sell your property and have somebody build a new house on it. That's not the district that it's in. So um, it's, I, it's. I do, I understand what you're saying, but I, that's not really what I'm saying. I'm, I'm not saying that we should be putting houses where the post office is, or, you know, where the Atlantic used to be or where the EMARC building is. I'm just saying these enormous replacement structures shouldn't be going there. I mean, it's fine if it's a mixed-use building, but why does it have to be so huge? Okay, well, that gets back to really where I was trying to get at was um, a process for coming up with design guidelines. We're going to focus um, some um, priorities on that. And, developing these guidelines as part of it. And I know you've made several presentations and some of some of the information is good, some of it's misinformation, which has to be corrected. But um, I'd want to gather that kind of that kind of stuff at these planning sessions. It'd be more like a meeting like this. We'd get them all bulleted. Um, and we'd do some research and come back for a workshop, probably in a, a different space where we could lay things out and develop the actual guideline there. Um, Understand too that we really are limited to this open meeting process. We can't talk behind the scenes, and so things get done in two-hour stints. You know, it's not something that gets done overnight. Unfortunately, it's just it takes a while for all of us to meet and come up with information, have public hearings that are noticed, get all that information, and, and these guys work incredible amount of hours, you know, making that data mean something. So that's that's what we're looking at doing. We just want to be included in the process. And all I the meetings that's, are that's publicly notified. I mean, we notice all the meetings; they're all up there. And, and um, you guys are in precinct five, I think. I'm sure. Yes. I think there's open seats on that. I don't know why those seats aren't filled for town meeting. Um, this seat sat open for two years plus. Julie, how long have you been here? That seat's been open. Two years. You know, there's always a need for people to get involved before the stuff gets to your neighborhood. That's how we yeah. do it. We welcome it because uh, now that you've watched all these, um, you know how many times we um, uh, sit in this room and there's not a single person or maybe 
um, one person uh, in, in the audience, and, and we don't have <coughs> that dialogue. We just um, have the, the dialogue um, among ourselves. So um, the more, the better, the better mm -hmm. discussion and more viewpoints, and, and we, we want that. So. Right, and I am involved when I get a notice that says I'm in a butter, and I didn't know there were any open seats on a Jewish town meeting. Or? I want to say there are there are 24 seats per district. Is that yes. what it is? And I thought I only counted 22 names. Um, there's a when's the time meeting? Uh, November. It starts on the 13th. So usually there's a, a precinct meeting before that, and you can fill an open seat just by getting the people in the room to say okay. Find out. Yeah, one of those. Oh, okay. And if if you want to know about upcoming CBDC meetings, the best way to get our agendas is to actually go on the town website and e-subscribe to CBDC agendas, and then every time one gets posted, you'll get an email about it because certain things you won't necessarily get a notice about in the mail. Um, but you can know everything they're discussing by subscribing to their agendas. Thank you. I mean, would, would Green Seed have been noticed on the postmark? Is that within the, the limits of that? I don't know. I'd have to look. Yeah. It might be just outside of it. Okay. Um, mm. Tonight, sorry. I wanted to just make sure that you guys had said the same thing to each other in terms of you had said that 90% of the commercial properties abut residential in this town that there was 12 to yeah. go and yeah. I just want to make know, sure I feel like right you might have yeah. said oh, the opposite, opposite. Yeah. Yeah. right so that's what I just wanted to make sure so she's, he's saying yeah. that there's only 12 properties commercial properties in town that don't Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah. I did this under. Oh yeah, if you well, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a guest of yeah. yeah, yeah. If you look right, if you if you think about it, if you look at every, uh, just about every commercial business, if you peek over the fence, usually you're looking at a at um, a, 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 a the backyard of a residence like like yours, um, but pretty much. You know, m most um, commercial districts, commercial businesses in town. So then you will the run into this then with Yes, the yeah, that, yeah, yeah, which was my point. This happens. Uh, we run into uh, it with 40 R. We run into it with every other zoning, every other zoning section as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, it isn't. It's. Uh, but 40 R allows apartments to be built, whereas the business didn't allow a transition from apartments to residences. Is that correct? The business district in downtown? Business yeah. It does not allow residential, correct? Right, but when you put 40 R in it, it makes it so that it can be a hybrid. It can go from business to residential. It has to be both. Oh, it has to be both. Uh, well, I guess well, you could do a smaller, you can do a smaller only residential project. Okay. That would be nice being there. Well, listen, the well, town listen, the business B, someone could come in and build. It allows you to trans switch from business to residential. Mixed. No, mixed. no it's mixed. mixed. It's a mixed oh. use. Okay. No, oh, okay. it doesn't allow you to, to switch the, the, the district. It allows you to do a use. That's what I mean, use. Yeah, yeah. but it's. Switch the use. The, the residential, I mean, there's, there is a multifamily residential, which is, I think, believe, allowed in the 40R. Yeah. Without the, um, without the commercial, yeah. Yeah. Without the, commercial <laughs> the mixed use. Okay. But it's, it's more constrained. You can't blow this high. Right. right. What was that comment? I'm sorry, Jim. You can't go as high if it's all residential. The height limit is 33. 33. If it's mixed, yeah. it's 45. Wouldn't it be ideal to have it just be residential well I think that there's some drive to, to keep the downtown as an active commercial area no, to I have realize businesses that we, we have openings the butcher shops and uh, you know like we have places I, I, I don't want to reiterate and go into what we've been begging you for a couple months I just I okay why is Green Street why is that neighborhood, which has been a residential neighborhood since it began, in a business B? Well, that was well, well before. Back into the 50s or many, something. We think many of the residential uses in the downtown area existed prior to the town's adoption of zoning. So, I mean, I don't know what happened in 1942 when the districts were drawn, but. But obviously it was 
zoned incorrectly because well, that not necessarily no. because listen that neighborhood historically and if we look at some of the stuff has always sort of been intertwined with what was happening commercially in that downtown and it wasn't just little single story colonials there were some pretty large buildings anchoring the corners of this of this neighborhood i mean the blackburn building is gigantic yep. the Doucet building is large the mf child building which is probably the best building in town Correct. It's a, it's a large building, although I don't think it's imposing. And everything across the street from Haven on Main Street was about the same size. Where um, Christopher's is right now, there were several buildings right up to the gas station that was there that were about the same height, you know, that 45-foot height. So the, the neighborhood has always sort of lived within what was happening in downtown, and that was commercial stuff and residential stuff, a little village. But why wouldn't they... Why wouldn't they zone it like it was built at the time you thought? I, I can't you know, so they, they, and, and, and honestly, that happened when the zoning was created in Reading, and like everywhere else in New England, and well, I'll leave it to New England, um, uh, there were lots of zones that were created that didn't fit what was actually built. I mean, there's, a, there's, there's whole, you know, neighborhoods here that you can't, that are, that have, non-conforming structures on them because the lots are too small and and, and all sorts of, of things like that so it's not that y your neighborhood isn't singled out nor ha nor is reading odd in that way that we have pre you know um sort of pre-existing non-conforming uses yeah yeah it, it was it was back in the 40s and 50s that was what was done and I can't tell you why, because I didn't exist back then. <laughs> <laughs> well, 50s, you probably existed. No. 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 <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What other... Could we, could we take anything else on if we're doing that? Um, that pretty... The second one up from the bottom the updating the subdivision regulations. I've had a preliminary meeting with the town engineer and the conservation um, administrator about um, kind of setting up sort of a working group for 2018 to look at that. So that, and that might be something, that's another thing that wouldn't have to go to town meeting since it's regulations. Um, okay. But that might be something that I would want one of you guys to help out with. One or more. Okay. So we get that started and then just let it go at its pace for a little while? Yeah, I mean, it seems like it's right, um, but it's it's not like necessarily as urgent as, I would say, the sub-district design guidelines. Because um, you kind of have a good hold of that process, you know, a good handle on that process. Um, but they're going to come in on a regular basis these four uh, yep. let four last subdivisions on cul-de-sacs and we see them constantly so you know, I mean it's not a flurry but right it's it's, it's yeah constant. I mean so this is a priority I was just yeah. putting it maybe second in yeah I, I agree yeah yeah I think that would be okay I make a plug for downtown parking. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get started. Parking requirements slash downtown parking. I know we've talked about it a little bit. Um, well, it's, it's curious that the people have been doing the, the parking utilization studies <clears throat> and the answer that has been coming back is that it's uh, not as, nowhere near as much of a problem as it feels. <laughs> I mean, it, 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 you know, yes, if we had more parking spots at the train station, people would, more people would park there. But that's about the entirety of the downtown parking problem with the current with the current development. I mean, it's going to change with the Postmark Square and uh, some of the other things, Reading Village, if those things uh, ever come to completion. But for now, the analysis says there there isn't really an issue 
No, the analysis says there isn't a shortage of parking. The issue is that it's the way it's used, right? Yeah. It's, it's underutilized, it's, it's in the wrong places, okay. and so it's, there's still an issue. The issue is getting people to use it the right way and find it. But right now, okay. everyone sees they want to use this spot. This spot's always full, and so they don't realize that there are 10 spots somewhere else. Or they're not really convenient for that particular use. Right. Yeah. It's okay. management and signage and right. Right. sharing and so could we um, approach that uh, I'm gonna say much like the sign bylaw rewrite was done in that it's not really it's not it's not necessarily this board um, entirely but um, some help, help from uh, economic development folks um, or maybe some other uh, um, resources in town that and look at how parking is actually used and what the demand is and, and that sort of thing. Because um, I think it's it's bigger than just the sort of the physical you know, inventory. You can start by collecting all the data we have. We've done several reports and so some a lot of stuff out there we should probably get and see what needs to be updated. The issue here is bandwidth. And, yeah. um, Always. <laughs> the answer is to build a multimodal transportation hub over in the industrial district with a parking garage, which frees up 200 parking spaces in the downtown. There's the issue there. Oh, no. Yeah. Yeah. Monday. Mm -hmm. No, well, the MBTA would have built that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that, the issue yeah. there would be the same time frame. Well, we could zone that area to be some sort of, um, I don't know, medical tech kind of Free zone, Dubai, I think Dubai. <laughs> but over there in industrial. Oh, yeah. Okay. I think we're at 8 30, so yeah. let's move on to this next. <coughs> so stay tuned to all of those CPDC notices, please. All right. Um, we have a continued public hearing for the four yard plan review 2024 blue screen. Another team member we have Tom Bertelis with DCI, traffic engineer on the project, uh, here to, to uh, present part of our presentation tonight and then also follow up with questions. Um, in terms of the agenda, um, we're going to go through the latest plans and modifications, <coughs> renderings, um, the traffic study, talk about parking counts, and then get right into QA. Um, and, um, I just want to say I recognize that this project, just being listening in a little bit in the previous hour, this project has brought up a lot of, um, you know, awareness of smart growth and strong feelings. Um, and I hope that, um, you know, we appreciate the feedback. I hope that comes across, that we appreciate the feedback that we've gotten from you all. <coughs> we started with you at the Butters. Um, and we certainly think that as in this process, it's gotten better. So uh, we, we absolutely thank you for that. Um, and we, we also um, have updates to share tonight, um, which we think have been further responsive to the, to the comments that we've heard. Um, and we've uh, really not stopped trying to be as responsive and solve problems as we can. And so hopefully that comes So um, So we have... Here. Uh, these are the parking memos, okay. and then we have plans as well. If you want to, okay. 
We can. What about the small ones? Do you have small plans for them? Uh, we do have small plans. Okay. 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 So this, we'll have all the plans up here. We also have boards tonight just to be able to look at everything simultaneously. I thought that might be helpful. Um, and sometimes it's easier to see things on boards. Um, so whenever you're ready, Julie, we can jump. All right, I just want to make sure yeah, that I can follow along. Okay. Each staff is different. Yeah, one is angle parking and one is on the street. Okay. Right. Thank you. So we talked next slide, then next slide. Um, so a couple of changes that, um, again, this is just for those uh, who are now very familiar with the building, this is along Gold Street right here. Um, we have our neighbors here, our Green Street neighbors here, and our fellow Gold Street commercial neighbor here. Um, things that we've changed. Um, first of all, there's the three foot setback all the way along here. And then we basically looked wherever we could basically to pull in that setback. And so we pulled that in to a seven foot setback from here on. And the, the way we're able to do that was basically you can see that the, the parcel is skinnier here, wider here, so we were able to sort of tuck everything up and extend this setback from three feet to seven feet along the Green Street side. Um, we're going to be getting to everything you see in front of you on the presentation. So, um, so that's one of the big changes that we've made. Um, also, um, you'll see that what we submitted this morning was we, we pulled, basically this used to be parallel parking right here, um, and now we've made it head-in parking. Um, and this has 65 spaces. Um, I'll be honest, we were working on this today to try and figure out how we could further maximize the parking. And if you click to the next slide, Julie, what we did here, this shows 69 spaces. And what you'll see is basically we've this extension right here was pulled in. We were able to move the elevator core and the stair core, actually work nicely with the lobby. And we were able to get 69 spaces within the garage, uh, which gets us to a 1.25 in the garage uh, for 55 units, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. So again, just to recap real quickly, three foot setback to a seven foot setback. Um, we now have 69 spaces in the garage um, and very similar sort of setbacks along Gould Street. We still have the five angled spaces along Gould Street uh, for short term pickups and deliveries, um, supporting both the residential and the retail. Um, and that 1.25 doesn't include those angled spots. Um, so we go to the next slide. Other major change, we pulled the entire floors two through four. <coughs> back off of the rear property line by at least 15 feet, 15 feet. Um, and so um, we just basically took a straight line from our property line, 15 feet, drew it back, and our building on floors two through four, two through four doesn't extend beyond that 15 foot setback line. And no balconies. No balconies as well. Um, we have 55 units. 29 one bedrooms, 21 two bedrooms, and six three bedrooms. So we've also reduced the unit count from 58 to 55. I think when we started this process, we were at 64, I believe. Um, so we've reduced those quite a bit um, in order to manage these setbacks um, and uh, based on the feedback that we've heard. Uh, so moving on to the next, you'll just see basically that these changes telegraph up through the four floors. Um, in terms of the 15-foot setback. We saw the same articulation of the facade along Gould Street, um, and really that's the, that's the summary of the changes in terms of uh, the floor plans and setbacks. Um, so if we'll go to the next page. So we were asked and um, uh, tried to do our best in terms of putting together sort of the details of this in a more clear format. Um, and 
So here, I'm just going to walk you through some perspective renderings that we have. Um, so here, basically, you'll see 24 Gould Street, the outline of the building. Uh, this is the outline of the parking. Um, and we have the upper building, as I just talked about, line. This is 15 feet back from our property line. Okay? And you'll see that the ground floor has the three foot setback and then the seven foot setback, as we just talked about. And in comparison, just to where um, our Green Street neighbors are, in terms of just uh, where the 15 foot setback is in relationship to the properties that are there, um, you can see. Um, but it varies, as you would expect in a neighborhood that's been built up over time. Um, so we go to the next slide. So this just basically shows the condition in section for 26 Green Street. Um, and so basically, we got top of the ridge line plus or minus 30 feet. We got a 14 foot plus or minus setback. You do have some decks and some egress uh, within that setback. Um, and then you'll see in terms of the building uh, at 24 Gould David, Street. Do yep. you want to present it from this side? Is that so you know, better? Back in the yep. um, so 20, 24 Gould Street, basically you see the parking floor, and then you see the residential floors above. Again, you see that 15 foot setback, you see that three to seven foot varies, you see there's no access by any resident closer than 15 feet, there's no rear balconies, um, and this 60, 60 foot is the distance, um, you know, this is the courtyard basically. And this is the distance to the, to the section of the building that fronts along Green Street. Okay, and again, we have these on board so we can pull them out and uh, take a look at them in more detail. So can we go to the next one? Just some perspectives. Current perspective, 16 foot plus or minus, it varies in different locations. Um, and see 26 Green Street here. We've got some decks and egress. Um, and then if you flip, basically this is what we're talking about in terms of afterwards. We have a three foot plus or minus. It goes to seven foot in this location um, back here. Um, you go from a 16 foot high wall to an 11 foot high wall. This was a change that we made. Um, this previously was a 15 foot high wall. We brought it down because we could. Basically, we're just slotting cars under there. So we could bring that roof height down a little bit um, and improve that, that height. Um, next slide. Condition at 20 Green Street 22 foot plus or minus at the top of the ridge, 16 foot back from their property line. You'll see our three feet, you'll see our 15 feet here. Slide. Current condition, there's an existing shed in the foreground here. Um, current 16 foot wall. If you click to the next slide, you'll see the proposed condition. Again, we've talked many times about sort of the planted buffer that's up here. Um, you know, these plantings are just, could be something different than what's shown. Um, but plantings, uh, we would be happy to plant something if our uh, neighbors preferred to plant something or didn't prefer to plant something, uh, we'd be happy to work with them to figure out how to use that three feet or seven feet in some cases. Again, it's our intention. We would sign an agreement with our neighbors basically to use that land. We want to formalize that agreement. Obviously, we want to be able to get there, back there and fix uh, the wall or do anything like that. But in terms of our neighbors' use of that property, we're happy, happy to have them use it and care for it. Uh, next slide. So again, 28 Green, Green Street, about a 10 foot off the property line. Here it's seven feet back. Um, uh, again, that's where it goes from three feet to seven feet, and then you see 15 feet being maintained throughout. Uh, next slide, perspectives. Uh, you see that change from three feet to, to seven feet here. You see, I'm sorry, this is where, this is the existing buildings, and where the building does sort of jut in and then go off and it is about 16 feet. Now if you go to the next slide, there you go. You see that hitch from three feet to seven feet. You see the 11 foot height of the wall back here. And then you see about a 17 foot uh, setback once you add in um, on both sides of the property line. Um, so 
Next slide. So again, if you're looking just from Green Street in an imaginary view, talked about fenestration, elevations of the Green Street side. Um, this is what basically you've seen in perspectives. You see the courtyard here. You see the building that fronts along Gould Street in the distance. You would see the two wings that cut towards Green Street coming out. The other thing that we did was we reduced, and you'll see it in the next one, we reduced the number of windows along the Green Street um, facade. Um, just responding to some of the uh, questions about uh, privacy and light and that kind of stuff. Um, and you'll see just, some, again, sort of the buffer plantings that we have in schematic form. So if you go to the next slide, <coughs> just this was a comparison of the window type that we had along the Green Street facade um, and what it is now if you just go back, Julie. Sorry, thank you. Uh, you'll see those changes and some of that more some more of that detailing. Um, so the next page, um, just real quickly, a summary of the changes, and then I'm going to hand it over to Tom to talk about traffic. We have further gross square foot reduction. We have the unit reduction. Um, and uh, again, from 58 to 55, uh, we have an increase in the parking of the garage um, and increase in the setback on the ground floor. Again, we talked about 3 foot to 7 foot and then the 15 foot setback on floors uh, two through four. Um, and that reduced height along the parking deck along the Green Street facade. So that's just some of the things that we did from the last meeting to this meeting to respond to um, the feedback that we've gotten. Um, and um, I know another thing we wanted to talk about was the traffic study, so I'm gonna jump right into that. Uh, we can cover all the questions at the end if that works for <coughs> Tom, take it away. Good evening, everybody. I've given a lot of presentations in Eastern Math, but I've never given a presentation in Reading, so <laughs> first time, but it's nice to see new faces. It's a lot of fun. So, traffic study, Wall Street project. So, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on existing conditions. I'm guessing that most of you are very interested in delay and capacity concerns. That's what most communities are most concerned with. But as you, you sort of got a background on what's going to happen with mixed use commercial and retail, I'm um, sorry, commercial and residential, and the new development of 55 dwelling units and 3,700 square feet of commercial. So you kind of have a background on what's going on. So we'll just uh, continue on to the traffic portion, we oh. give you an idea, we, I'm sorry. Is this what you wanted? Yep, 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 yep. Okay. So you guys can rest assured that we follow the MassDOT guidelines for traffic impact studies that include getting peak hour counts through our AM to our PM counts at these seven intersections and also getting 48 hour counts along Main Street. <coughs> so next slide. This is where we got the 48 hour counts from, and the red circles are where we got the peak hour counts from in order to build the traffic model. Next slide. So, very quickly, these are the signalized intersections. I'm sure you guys recognize these intersections along Main Street. Uh, next slide. The unsignalized intersections include these Ash at Gould, Haven at Gould. Next slide. Also, Washington Street at Ash, Haven at High, also existing unsignalized. Safety analysis, relatively safe intersections. There weren't any fatals. There were five of the seven had, were below state averages. The two that were above state averages didn't have fatals or very few injuries. And they were due, as you can see here, due to bigger issues, geometric issues. Why the, the crashes occurred. So we'll, we'll go on to the next slide. <coughs> All right. So trip generation. This is the start of the capacity analysis. There's multi steps. Step one is chip generation, then distribution, then mode split, and the root assignment. That's how you do a, a tribe study. You'll notice here that we decided to be conservative. Actually, 
Julie, <laughs> we call them Julie, I said, Julie, can we assume that there's a lot of bus trips? Because if you see here, 12% of people use the bus, and there's some people walking and biking, and Julie said, let's be conservative, let's just assume 100% driving. We did assume, we did use a 4.4% with carpool, but other than that, we, we went with zero biking, zero walking, zero busing. Just, let's just assume that people are driving. So that's what we did here to come up with the trips. This is a, a trip generation. Uh, so here you can see here when we came up with the trips, 59 a.m. trips and 71 p.m. trips. These are unadjusted trips. We, um, we also took into account the existing commercial property there. We actually did empirical counts, meaning we went out there and counted the 21 a.m also 21 p.m. existing trips out there. So when we did the study, we assumed the net impact on the development. So our net vehicle trips of 38 a.m. and 50 p.m. I did want to point out that's per hour. I've done these studies in the past and people say, well, really, during rush hour? You know, rush hour can be from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., but this is per hour, so you can actually have that many trips every hour. Now, to get an idea, 50 trips per hour on average, 60 minutes in an hour, so maybe roughly one trip a minute. Minute goes by, another trip. Minute goes by, another trip. And we're talking intersections that have roughly a thousand trips per hour. Okay? So this is just so sort of like I always like to get my hands dirty and kind of like feel the numbers. You go out to a street, all right, so this street has about a thousand trips per hour, and this development is going to add about a trip per minute. So you have a thousand trips, boom, a minute goes by another trip. So the reason why you'll see when we get to later slides that there's no change in level of service. And this is the salient slide to explain that. Because when you have a thousand trips per hour and roughly a trip per minute, it's difficult to get the delay Increase the delay so much that you have a big impact. Like you have to wait. Who likes waiting at intersections? Nobody, right? So this is what it basically measures: is the delay. If you if you wait more than 80 seconds at a signalized <coughs> intersection, or more than 50 seconds at a non-signalized intersection, then you have level service F, right? You have, you fail. But none of these intersections go to a fail or even change. In fact, none of the movements actually change in level of service. So these are the numbers that kind of keep in mind. One. One trip per minute. So we'll go to the next slide. This is this is what we the census tract that we used. Next slide. Um, we we assumed that we went to the trip distribution. The trip distribution was. I apologize for the poor quality. I just I'm just noticing that right now. So there's poor quality. It's really hard to read. But these are the intersections we chose, and we can assure you that we. Um, we use the mass dot guidelines. This is all the standard. We couldn't we couldn't look at every intersection in Reading, um, so we did have to uh, pick and choose, and we did get this approved by the town. You'll notice the green streets not on here, so we consolidated um, to bring the trips to here. Some of them go down Ash or down Green Street, but nonetheless, we we did use the official guidelines in case anyone's looking at this and saying, well, "Why do you leave out my intersection?" Or, or my neighborhood. Um, so we'll go on to the next slide. And then, so you guys saw the, the site generated trips from the earlier slide of 50 trips. We basically took those trips and distributed them using the traffic model onto the network. So this is the number of trips onto the network. The slide before this was the percentage at every intersection. Next slide. These are the volumes. The build volumes just means, so build versus no build. No build is if the project doesn't get built, how many trips are there in the build are the trips generated plus the no build volumes, seven years into the future are the build volumes. So this is the volumes that you're gonna see at every intersection seven years into the future. So we'll skip to the fun slide. So next slide, here's the fun slide. This is debatably the most important slide in the whole presentation. So if you guys were asleep up until now, you can wake up and look at this slide. This is the one that says, you know, who, you know, who has kids here to bring home report cards, right? Some of you? 
The A through F is similar to a report card. It's a way of measuring qualitatively each intersection and quantitatively because, like I said before, if you get to 80 seconds, you become an F. You can see there are, so there's an F here, for example, um, at Washington and Maine in one of the movements. And the traffic model basically compares the no build versus the build, which, was, which I would mentioned before. So if the project didn't get built, what would happen seven years into the future? And we did take into account other developments, Redding Woods, um, a, a couple other ones. The postmark square, by the way, the new postmark square, the trip generator is going to be less than the current trips. So we didn't include it in here because the net trips is zero. But we did include all other developments in the area and we included the background growth. We went to the uh, Metropolitan Planning Organization and we said, what's the uh, growth? And then we made a conservative adjustment and then we assumed the background growth to get to the 2024 no bill. And you can see here the level of service degrades in all these places where it's highlighted in orange, right? So you can see here it goes from E to F here and from C to D here. So there's a few places where it gets worse. However, in the built condition, there are no movements that degrade in level of service. And it, it kind of goes back to, well, a trip a minute on average onto a street with a thousand trips per hour. It's just not enough to put it over the edge. And you can see here, none of the movements degrade, none of the intersections degrade. Um, there are increases <coughs> But they're small, the average 0.7 seconds. So if you're in a car, you know, don't have enough time to change the station on the radio. So you won't see large <coughs> increases in delay. Next slide. So, last slide. Conclusion 55 residential dwelling units, 3,700 square feet of retail space. There's no fatals. Um, there's no salient safety issues to be addressed. Trip generation, 100% vehicle usage was assumed for the project, meaning no bus, bike, walk was assumed. Expected to generate 38 a.m. trips <coughs> net, of course, 50 p.m. peak hour trips. Once again, net um, less than one trip per minute on average. And zero movements to grade in level of service in the network. I don't know if we're going to do a Q&A now or later. And just, okay. okay. All right, well, I'll be. I'm just going to really quickly hit on, thank you, Tom, and really quickly hit on just perspectives on parking ratios. Um, and um, just to give some examples of uh, both Reading projects and projects that we own and manage, um, what we experience um, in terms of parking. Um, so this just basically shows, you know, 24 gold, uh, the market to affordable in terms of units, um, just because that actually does dictate, surprisingly, how much car usage there is, um, or maybe not surprisingly. <coughs> um, what we've put in here is 69 spaces, gets us to 1.25, which we now have in the garage. Um, at 30 Haven, we talked to the property manager just the other day, they have 53 units, they're full, they have 20% affordability, um, and the residential parking built was 63 residential units, they're actually using 61, uh, so they have an actual parking count ratio of 1.15. The Box District in Chelsea was another smart growth project, actually not as good a transit location as this location. We have 145, 49 units built across three different buildings, um, and 21% of those are affordable. We built out 173 parking spaces. We currently use only 153 for those 149 spaces. We just put out a special for parking, um, and we, you know, got one or two takers, um, and so we're at 1.03. Um, in the box district. Coolidge School Apartments, it's a 55 plus age restricted in Watertown. Uh, 38 units, 40% affordable. We had 75 parking spaces there. We only use 41 um, and we're 1.07. Um, and I think we've consistently seen um, these numbers 
you know, sort of stay flat or even sort of trail down as we have owned them. Uh, you know, these are these are two projects. This is probably about eight years old, five years old. Um, and 30 Haven is a couple years old as well. Seven years old. Seven years old. Um, so just to give you some perspective on where sort of parking ratios are, um, in our experience, obviously we don't. Uh, there are others who have experience out there. Um, but I uh, just wanted to make that known. So if you can click to the next slide. Um, so um, we'd be happy to take your questions um, and uh, appreciate the time. Uh, Thanks. We're going to do board questions first and then we'll take public comments. From here, huh? Can you give me the breakdown of one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom units? Yes. Uh, excuse me while I pull it up. So we have 29 one bedrooms, 21 two bedrooms, and six three bedrooms. That's 56 units. Did I write it down wrong? Five. We have five three beds. Five. five three beds. I apologize. Okay. And the so which floor is the only which floor only has one three bedroom? Looks like the top floor. Mm -hmm. Top floor has two. Because if you look at floor two. Right here. Hard to see on here, but it's this one. Okay. I'm oh, sorry, this is the first one. Apologize about that. Level two. Yeah, level two. <laughs> you walk me through how the trash is going to get in and out of the building again and how you're going to deal with loading with an 11 foot opening on that. Mm -hmm. So we go back. So again, sort of, so there's trash chutes on every level. There's two doors on every level, <coughs> level recycling <coughs> and trash. So residents will just go on their floor, drop it down the chute. It'll end up in a compactor here. And basically these carts can be rolled out. Um, so the trash can come in here, carts can be rolled out and loaded in. Um, and you know, again, because we have this space open now, uh, we just have a lot more room to, to maneuver with the trash trucks. So this happens on any number of our sort of projects where you know we've got trash chutes, trash compactors, and maintenance works with the trash company basically to get them out the double doors and get them uh, towards the street. And it happens, there's nothing that's left on the sidewalk um, ever. But the trash truck won't be able to pull it. It'll be on the street. It'll be, it'll be on the street basically okay. and you know pull in here. And basically the whole operation is probably about 20 minutes. Um, you know, it's very quick. At properties of this size, it's about two times a week. How about with resident load in and load out being residential, you know, the 30th of the month? Mm -hmm. So we so now have the know. five spaces here, which are, you know, um, standard size spaces angled in, which are short term, intended to be short term. So for short term delivery, short term loading, the UPS truck, the, the postal service truck. Um, we anticipate this. For in terms of move-ins, um, we have a lot more space back here. We will actively use these, this space and this drive aisle here and along here. And basically, this is you know this is a this is a, a building that's going to have a manager here on site. Um, so they're going to be and a maintenance person as well. They're going to be actively you know, managing this area. In the day, I expect this, you know, based on our other developments, I expect that this will be 50% full. Um, and generally, we will ask residents to move in during weekdays and times when we have more time and more space and when the elevator is not in use as much. Because that's another thing. We actually have to lock down the elevator, have people move in and out. So we give them very specific windows 
when we know that they can fit in the garage and 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 load and unload into the elevator. One elevator for this entire property? Yes, one elevator. How about if let's say you mentioned a potential grocery store going in the front? Mm -hmm. 18 wheels pulling up to do their deliveries. So well, any any retailer that requires 18 wheelers for deliveries will not be a retailer here. I can just tell you that. Um, and basically, what we get is is you know box trucks, um, vans, that kind of sort of level of delivery for retailers of this size. Again, this is up to 3,700 square feet. It could possibly be subdivided. They can use these short-term parking spots. We can also accommodate them in here as well. But an 18-wheeler moving up Gold Street, um, you know, it, it, it's, it doesn't work. It doesn't work, and it's not, and a retailer who requires that is not going to locate here. It's a great idea, but you often can't control what your supplier sent. Well, um, we can certainly prohibit it in our lease that what drop rates and, and times are, and we do at all of our, I mean, so 225 Center in Jamaica Plain, we have um, a, a burger and fry kind of joint. You know, we tell them when they can have deliveries and when they can't, because um, we have 103 residential units above, and we don't want our, not, not to mention the whole rest of the neighborhood, but just selfishly, we don't want our residents, you know, conflicting with deliveries and you know, getting woken up by a delivery at five o'clock in the morning or anything like that. We don't want them, you know, competing with an eighteen wheeler on Gould Street. <coughs> I have no no new questions at this point. Um I guess this is not the latest parking. So how many compact parking spaces do we have there? The latest plan I think it's about it's there it's uh, it's about 33, depending upon which scheme it is. Um, if it's, uh, it should be 33. Is um, that the scheme? Scheme yeah. right here. Yeah. Well, we'll just count them. So we have. Thirty-seven spaces out of sixty-nine. Thirty-seven out of sixty-nine. Fifty-three percent. Fifty-four percent. Maybe the one. I'm going to say fifty-three percent. This is kind of something I've been thinking about since John mentioned last time about this one point two five being some number we stick to. And um, when we wrote the zoning, and this came up because John mentioned that and kind of reviewed the whole PowerPoint presentation that we did. One of the questions that came up was why is why no setbacks and why this parking number? Because those are what limit the size of the project. Because you have to fit the parking in, you have to do something with the building to step back, you know, to make it look nice, but also get it to fit and work for you. And then that eventually determines how many units can fit. We didn't write into this design standard the limit on the compact parking, but we did do it on Gateway. And the Mass Smart Growth Guidelines limit it as well, or at least recommend 30%. So this is like, this is 53%. And not only that, but they're smaller than the recommended size, the seven and a half feet. They're the Cambridge standard. Versus the, the Smart Growth Guide, which is saying eight, eight by 17 meters, like seven and a half by 16. For what it's worth, yeah. <laughs> so that probably, I mean, I was just counting before I saw this change here, but you're probably losing three spots if you have to reduce it down to some reasonable number, let's say 40%. So then you're lower than the 125. Does that reduce your unit count? You know, that's what, but before I saw this parking lot, that's what I was thinking was, um, that you really only, if you brought the compact parking numbers down to the 30% or 35%, you're going to lose three or four spaces. That's going to require you to get rid of a unit. 
for two to get into that. Well, it's just when you also had the outdoor parking, so you were, you were going to be well below the 125. It's a concern to me that there are this many par compact parking spaces that are also smaller than they need to be. And in relation, and as a as a guide to density, or yeah, as a guide, as a guide to as a usability, con or? as a controlling guide to the density, just the number of households, yeah. because from a density of built envelope, we're well below the standard of FAR, right? Yeah, no, I so think you've done an admirable job on the back side of this property to start scaling it back. That's that's fine. But FAR has never been one of those things I've thought of as um, yeah. as something that, that's so something thing really in this this level of development. So um, it's just less doors in the building, less number of you know, people that are living there. That's what you're trying to control. The building size is the building size. But in terms of the number of people walking through the front door that say I live there. Um, yeah, that's what you're trying to pinpoint, and that that would reduce the building size to some extent. Let's say you lost two units, the the 